morning, everyone, and thank you for joining and Zooming with us for Warrior Connection's fifth educational lecture. This is a very exciting time for us as, as Pink Aid Connecticut and Long Island are collaborating together for the first time to bring the latest information from both sides of the sound. We're so excited about that. And one of the advantages to Zoom is as Pink Aid expands nationally, it gives us the opportunity to have a much broader reach and share our Warrior Connection and Pink Purse programs with so many others across the states. So for those new to our program, we started our Warrior Connection series in 2018 with the mission to have our breast cancer survivors, supporters, families, friends, and the community at large stay connected by having access to the most current breakthroughs in breast health presented by leading medical experts. How lucky are we to have the medical experts giving us their time and taking time away from their patients. So thank you, thank you. Um, this is our gift of education that we are so happy to give back to our communities who have been so supportive of Pink Aid. We all know knowledge is power and we love to be able to give this gift to the community. Our vision has always been to provide a special morning of bonding, education, and conversation, followed by an interactive question and answer session. So in addition to educational programs like this, we have two other parts of Warrior Connection. One is our, our peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program. It's a one-on-one -on -one where we match a newly diagnosed patient with one of our Pink Aid Warriors to offer friendship, inspiration through their own personal breast cancer experiences. To find more about the peer-to-peer -peer program, you could go to our website, you go to Get Help, and you'll see all you'll see a header of Warrior Connection and the programs are underneath it. There is no better comfort, as we all know, than having someone to reach out to with personal questions and thoughts when going through a breast cancer diagnosis. And as the world gets closer to being back to normal, we're going to begin to build out our social component of the Warrior Connection and create an avenue for those dealing with the diagnosis to gather together, together to connect with one another, whether to play cards, gather for a book group, or just being together so they can share the same breast experiences. Nobody likes to be alone, so it feels really great to have somebody by your side. Um, and now we are lucky enough to have an incredible team to discuss the most up-to-date developments in genetics and new therapeutics and how lifestyle choices can impact your risk of developing breast cancer. Here today to introduce this all-star dream team, Dr. Richard Zelkowitz, Susan Capasso, and Lauren Fish Henry are our wonderful Pink Aid presidents who've put this educational program together for all of you. Michelle Kornman, Deb Katz, and Lauren Koch. And now I have the honor of passing this over to Deb Katz. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on today. We're so excited, as Amy said, for this presentation to you. Before it starts, I just want to read the uh, quick bios of Susan Capasso and Dr. Zelkowitz. Uh, Susan R. Capasso has a BA in zoology from the University of Vermont, a master's in biology specializing in genetics from Georgetown, and her educational doctorate in educational leadership from Hartford. She also attended the Institute for Education Management at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard. She is a certified genetic counselor who is a charter member of the American Board of Genetic Counseling, a diplomate of the American Board of Medical Genetics, and a charter member of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. Additionally, she has worked as a researcher, a college professor, a college administrator, among many, many other roles. Welcome, Dr. Welcome, Susan Capasso. Dr. Rich Zelkowitz is well known in the Pink Aid community. Dr. Zelkowitz won the Pink Heart Award. Uh, he was a recipient at our annual Pink Luncheon for his compassion and dedication to his patients. He earned his medical degree from New York Medical College and completed a fellowship in hematology and oncology through the Brown University School of Medicine and a second fellowship in bone marrow transplant through the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. In 1997, he founded the Smilo Family Breast Health Center at Norwalk Hospital and was on the medical staff there until 2020, when he became the regional medical director of the Hartford Healthcare Cancer Institute Breast Program in the Fairfield region. Dr. Zelkowitz initiated the state's first breast navigator program to help guide patients and families through their cancer journey. He also launched the state's first cold cap program to prevent hair loss in breast cancer patients receiving chemotherapy. 
Dr. Zelkowitz is a farm, former consultant with the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Department of Medicine. He is also a member of the American Society of Breast Disease and the New York Metropolitan Breast Cancer Group. I will now hand it off to Susan Capasso for her presentation. My presentation is on genetic counseling and hereditary uh, cancer panel testing. So genetic counselors have advanced training in medical genetics and counseling to guide and support patients seeking more information about how inherited diseases and conditions might affect them or their families and to interpret genetic test results based on your personal and family history. Now you may be referred to a genetic counselor by a physician or another member of the medical team to discuss your family history and genetic risk or before or after having genetic testing. Genetic counselors help you to understand your genetic risks based on your family history, your genetic risks for certain cancers or other diseases and whether the genetic testing might be right for you. What the results of the genetic tests may mean for you and your family is extremely important in the process. With expertise in counseling, genetic counselors can also provide emotional support as you make decisions and they help to empower you with information for your overall health care. Now, most cancers occur in people who do not have a family history, and we say that that is sporadic. Some families have more of the same kind or related kinds of cancer than expected in the general population with no specific pattern of inheritance. This is likely caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. We refer to this as being familial. Now those cancers in which the cancer is passed down generation through generation by inheriting pathogenic variants, the old term was mutated genes, we've now changed over to call it pathogenic variants, is hereditary. Only five to 10% of cancers are actually hereditary. And many of the patients, when they come and see genetic counselors and myself, um, they, don't, they don't seem to think this. They think that most cancers are hereditary. Now, determining which families have cancer related to an inherited pathogenic variant is important since the cancer risk in hereditary cancer families are much higher than the general population. Following published guidelines for increased surveillance, chemo prevention and preventative surgeries, cancer risks have been reduced in many individuals with inherited cancer predispositions. Now, the first thing that a genetic counselor will do when they're meeting with a patient is they will obtain a three generation pedigree. Now you try to get a three generation and sometimes you, you can't do that. And sometimes I can go even further back, but my, the three generation pedigree is, is pretty standard. And we're looking for the types of cancers that are in the family. The age of diagnosis is very important. Ethnicity and results of any cancer testing in any relative, if you can get this information. Now, when we look at how these cancer genes are inherited, it's inherited as a single gene autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning that Usually you can find a parent who has the disease and they have a 50-50 chance of passing it on to their children. You only need one copy of the gene. Now this is different from other diseases, say Tay-Sachs, sickle cell, where you needed to have two copies, that's autosomal recessive. In the autosomal dominant, you only need one. And in the autosomal dominant, we also see that you're just as likely to pass it on to a male as you are to a female. And granted with these different um, cancer genes, they have different, um, depending upon the gender, there will be different manifestations and risks. So looking at the genetic red flags was what I do when I, when I talk to the patients as I'm looking and I'm putting down, as I'm talking to them, I'm looking for things. I'm looking for a family history of multiple affected relatives, a condition in the less often affected sex. For example, if you find that someone in the family has, has a male that's had breast cancer, earlier age at onset of the disease and expected, disease in the absence of known risk factors, multiple primary tumors in the same person, bilateral disease, and non-cancer findings suggestive of a syndrome. This happens quite frequently when I'm talking to someone and I'm looking and talk, talking to them about some other things that happened in their family. So I'm talking to them about the inheritance of 
those disorders. We also look at ethnic predisposition because we all know that there are certain groups that are more likely to get say BRCA1 and BRCA2, such as the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And then I always look at consanguinity because if you've got a family where there's first cousin marriages of which um, I do find, um, then we wanna talk to them about that and talk about a coefficient of um, consanguinity. So in the old days, and I'm saying this was about even like 10 years ago, before I started doing panel tests, we would do single um, gene tests. And for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, we'd be looking at BRCA1 and BRCA2. For colon cancer, we'd be looking at the genes that are found in Lynch syndrome, or we would look at polyposis syndrome for APC. This was previously done in a sequential manner and people stopped if a mutation was detected. But it's important to identify patients at risk for other breast cancer genes. And we now have multi-gene panels that are increasingly recommended to um, test people that have been diagnosed with breast cancer, for example. And some of these other genes are TP53, PALB2, P10. And knowledge of these other genes can influence radiation therapy and chemotherapy um, decisions. So this slide is just showing you when you're looking at hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, what are the um, areas of the body which are affected? And it's the breast, pancreatic, ovarian for females, and prostate for males. So genetic testing has really expanded due to the new technology that utilizes next generation sequencing, or, or you'll see it written as in NGS, because it allows for things that's happened with genetic testing is the cost has gone down. Multi-gene panels allow simultaneous sequencing of many genes associated with a specific family cancer phenotype or multiple phenotypes. And the benefits of the multi-gene panel is that it provides a better diagnostic yield compared with a limited BRCA1 and BRCA2 ge genetic test for patients at risk for hereditary breast cancer or individuals diagnosed with breast cancer. And in a retrospective comparison of the multiple gen genetic tests, that was, there was no difference between the multi-gene panel test and the limited BRCA1 and BRCA2 test in the detection of potentially harmful BRCA pathogenic variants. So patients at risk for hereditary cancer syndromes can benefit from upfront, more efficient, multi-gene panel testing without any sacrifice to the BRCA testing capability. And this multi-gene panel testing includes intermediate penetrant genes of unclear action. So sometimes when we get a result back, we, it says, oh, it's an elevated risk for breast cancer. Well, this isn't really, the patients don't always like this because I'm not giving them a number of what their risk is. And the multi-gene panel testing should be offered in the context of professional expertise with pre and post test counseling, telling them what to expect in the beginning, as well as going over the results with them in the end. The multi-gene panel is more cost-effective and time-effective than, than sequential testing, and it can reveal more than one pathogenic mutation. Some people have more than one, and some in the old days, we wouldn't have picked this up. <clears throat> the results can be complicated to interpret sometimes, and testing may find pathogenic variants that show a moderate or uncertain risk of cancer. And it may be hard to know what you should do with the results. So this slide I think is, is, is very good because it shows you here that there are multiple genes that we now know can increase the risk of a single cancer. In this case, it's, the, it's breast. And we also on the other side of the slide, there are multiple cancers can be associated with a single gene. So we always go, always go through this with the patient that, okay, if you had TP53, then these are all the areas of the body that can be affected and you would need to be in increased surveillance. This slide is also important because this shows that approximately 46, there's approximately a 46% increase in mutations detected by analyzing additional genes in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer patients. And this is showing you that 
single syndrome testing alone will miss mutation carriers and that there, there are significant hereditary cancer risks associated with multiple other genes that were previously weren't tested. So when you get your result back, it can be positive. Now this isn't as likely because it, remember that only five to 10% of the cancers are actually caused by a gene. But if it's identified that you have a positive result, this would mean that you have an increased risk for certain types of cancers. Different mutations are linked to increased risks for different types of cancers. The risks may differ for the different mutations. And I, have, I go through this as well as other genetic cancers would when we're discussing this with the patient. Some are very high, others are less. But still, if you have a positive result, it's more than the general public. In a positive test result, it may be offered special, you may be offered special or more frequent cancer screening exams to find any cancers that develop as early as possible, dependent on the specific mutated genes. Originally, there were concerns that some mutations on multi-gene panels have no clear guidelines about the best screening exams to use or how often, but we see that the NCCN guidelines are increasing with these genes. There's also the prophylactic surgery. Patients may be offered certain types of surgeries that may help reduce or risk their, and reduce the risk of developing cancers, most commonly a mastectomy, ovoforectomy, or hysterectomy. If an individual is positive for a genetic mutation, then family members may also carry the same mutation. Remember back to the slide that I had with the autosomal dominant, 50-50 chance. So if first degree relatives have the mutation, then it's a 50% risk to have the same one. For second degree relatives, 25%, and third degree relatives, 12.5%. And a genetic counselor helps to identify who in the family is at risk of having the mutation, who should be tested, and when they should be tested. And this is one of the things, it's called cascade testing, and this is something that I do frequently. Now, you may have a negative test result. Now, you could have a pathogenic variant in a gene, but technology is not there yet. And we see this, that we're finding all these new results that come out. I tell my students all the time, don't blink because you don't know if we're gonna find another gene next week that we're gonna have to test. Some types of cancers may occur in several people in a family without being caused by a genetic mutation. I find this quite often. And there may be a pathogenic variant in other members of your family, but you, don't, you didn't have it. So just because you didn't have it doesn't mean that one of your siblings might not have it. We also have what's called a variant of uncertain significance, which a lot of patients, when I explain this to them, this is something where I can't say that this is actually a mutation, um, and many of these do change. You see these in affected and non-affected individuals. One area that's important to remember is you're going to see these more commonly in people who are not from European descent. So in my African-American patients, Hispanic patients, they're gonna be more likely to have a VUS. And this is because at this point in time, the data that we have collected has been more, has been done more commonly with those of ethno, of Eurocentric descent. So that it is changing, but it's important as a genetic counselor to tell your patients this so they understand that's what this means and that this could change. And I'm also always getting amended reports that are coming in where these variants of uncertain significance are changing. So I wanna close with saying to you, and I, is that I tell my students all the time, and I also tell my patients that knowledge is empowering to know whether or not you have these genes, whether or not you can pass them on is very important. I'm going off. Fabulous. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. That was that was wonderful. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat, and we can address them at the end of the of the presentations. Um, so I should go Rich, off because I'm in the same room, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, Susan, okay. if you stop sharing your screen, then um, Rich can share. Ah, wait a minute. Just wait for one second. Okay, great. 
Okay, Rich, all you. See if we can figure out how to do this. You're doing great. <clears throat> the way do we share the screen? Share the screen. Share the screen. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, you know I love to come uh, to anything which involves Pink Aid. I, I just want to make two points about what Sue said before I get into what I was going to talk about. Uh, having genetic testing means having genetic testing that's up to date. So if you had your genetic testing 10 and 15 years ago, as you heard from Dr. Capasso, you may not be up to date. Um, and so that's a very, very important issue. And the second thing, which is even more important, is that as you'll see, most people do not have a genetic mutation. So if your genetics are negative, unquestionably, if I, anything comes at it is that I say, you still need to get your mammogram and ultrasounds and whatnot as is appropriate. So what Sue talked to you about was the approach to the high risk, but patients who don't necessarily have breast cancer. What I'm gonna to talk to you about is what's new and what's different in the patients who have active breast cancer or who, or who have had breast cancer. And fortunately, there are more people who have had it than who actually have it. So I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of an introduction to genetics, a really simple introduction. First and foremost, everybody has BRCA genes. BRCA genes are genes that are within everybody's cells. BRCA genes work with BRCA proteins to repair abnormal breaks that occur. This is not an abnormal process. This is a normal recurring process. We're gonna talk about two major types of breaks, single strand and double strand. There are a lot more, but we're gonna to try to keep it simple. And the BRCA gene is important in maintaining normal repair of double stranded breaks. By maintaining genetic stability, this will suppress tumor formation by promoting these double stranded break repairs. This is something called homologous recombination. That's the most difficult word I'm going to use. <laughs> when you have a mutation in the BRCA gene, not a normal BRCA gene, a mutation in the BRCA gene, that prevents the BRCA protein's ability to repair the normal damaged DNA. What then happens is you get defect, and these defects can go on to lead to tumor formation. Or said differently, if either the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, gene has a mutation, the repair process within the cell is defective, and in some cases can lead to tumor formation. Remember we said we're going to focus on double-stranded and single-stranded breaks in the normal process. So if you have a BRCA-mutated cell, you cannot use the double-stranded repair process that's normal, and you're dependent on the single strand process, and the single strand process is where this part comes in, which we'll come back to. So, BRCA genes normally create a protein that fixes double stranded breaks in DNA, and when you have a mutation in the BRCA gene, it can mean that the protein repair damage change is non functional, and this increases your risk of getting cancer. So, here's a normal DNA strand, and we're going to focus on the second and the last. It says DNA single strand breaks, and in the, in the last one, it says DNA double strand breaks. The most common kind of breaks are single strand breaks. The most lethal form of damage repair is double strand. Here is another picture. You can see at the single strand focus is where the PARP enzyme is involved. And on the last one where it says double-stranded breaks, that BRCA mediated. So if BRCA is mutated, then that process becomes abnormal. 
at the site of the single strand breaks is where the PARP comes in. So what does a PARP inhibitor do? A PARP inhibitor is a drug. It acts as a PARP, excuse me, as a PARP enzyme trapper, and it now prevents the repair of the single strand breaks. It's, it demonstrates greater activity in BRCA positive homologous repair deficient cells compared with matching normal cells. PARP inhibitors can cause specific cell death in tumor cells because the double-stranded focus is already compromised. It's gonna all come together, watch. So this is a normal cell. Here on the first box, you have a normal cell. On the left, it says ba base excision repair. That's PARP mediated. That's single strength, sing single strand. <clears throat> to the right, it says homologous recombination and intact BRCA, you have these breaks which are normal and the breaks are repaired and in the bottom you have a normal cell. The middle one is a patient with a BRCA mutation. BRCA has an X fluid so it doesn't work well. PARP enables these abnormal tumor cells to continue to proliferate and you have repair but unfortunately you have repair of a bad cell or tumor cell. If you combine the BRCA mutation with a PARP inhibitor, you get blockage of the double strand because the BRCA is a, a defective. The PARP inhibitor, the PARP inhibitor inhibits the PARP enzyme, which promotes the tumor. Double stranded breaks do not get repaired, and the tumor cell dies. That's what this is all about. So with that easiness out of the way, we know that BRCA gene associated cancers account for only 10% of the breast cancer. So having a negative gene does not mean you don't have to have a mammogram and an ultrasound and an exam. You've all seen this slide a bazillion times. The range of these numbers change in everybody's report but clearly we can say that the risk of breast cancer is significant, the risk of ovarian cancer is significant, and the risk of pancreatic and prostate cancer is still significant, especially if you're a patient with those issues. But these are the primary diseases we focus on when we're talking about BRCA. All right, so who do we test? Well, I, I have made a habit of keeping my friend, Dr. Capasso over here quite busy. But this has really evolved. So initially, when we tested, as we got the genes probably late 99 and early 2000, we really were testing people to see who, was, who else was at risk. Who do we need to screen more aggressively? And if you, if you look at 2005, we're really not screening any patients who are cancer patients. We're screening first degree relative, second degree relative, that cause it on the, on the third side. We're not screening patients when we started doing this. In 2020, we evolved a little bit. We, knew, we now know which population of patients were more likely to be positive. And in trying to be cost effective at that time, we were focusing on these subgroups less than 45 to 50, triple negative and less than 60, age and Ashkenazi, and the list goes on and on. At this point, everything we were doing had nothing to do with PARP inhibitors and med any medication. We use this information to decide who, what we would do with family members. We use this information for people who are actively, who had active breast cancer to decide what the appropriate surgeries and prophylactic surgeries were, but we had nothing that told us what else, we, what else could we do with this information? What else could we bring to the table for patients who have BRCA mutations? So on we went. And so in, in, in the late 2017, we had Olympiad A. This was the first trial where we used PARP inhibitors as a therapeutic modality. 
In English, that means this is a pill we could give to patients who had an issue. And we took patients who were BRCA positive, who had advanced or metastatic breast cancer, okay? And a group of those patients got a PARP inhibitor called the Laparib, and, and a group got a treatment of, of oncologist choice. So this, so this is this is this is a race, right? Two people go to the finish line. One is going to win. One is going to lose. So here, for the first time, we looked at an alternative, at least in upfront metastatic patients, of an alternative to chemotherapy. And a picture is worth a thousand words. The dark line is the elaparib. Elaparib is the PARP inhibitor. And as you can see, the PARP inhibitor did better in patients with advanced disease compared to standard chemotherapy uh, for patients who had a BRCA mutation. There was another trial, it was called Embraca. It is very, very similar. In oncology, we always like when, when a, second, a second trial confirms what we saw in the first trial. This is a different PARP inhibitor. It's called Tazolaparib, which is very hard to say if you had a speech impediment in, high, in elementary school. <laughs> Uh, and again, though, you saw that the PARP inhibitor clearly did better than chemotherapy. So this was, this was really changed our focus. Now, all of a sudden, any patient who had breast cancer, regardless of what their family history is and what their ethnicity is and, and, and where they grew up, we were now testing all our patients with advanced breast cancer because... If we found an unexpected BRCA mutation, we had another drug. We had another drug that we could offer them. In oncology, everything goes backwards. I think most of you have heard me say this before. Every time we do a drug, we do it in an advanced state, and then we kind of move it forward to earlier stage. So we recently got results of a trial called Olympia A. And all that white lettering that says randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center, ba 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 ba, basically was we gave PARP inhibitors to a selected group of patients with early-stage disease who had already had standard therapy, the standard chemotherapy, the standard, the standard immunotherapy, which is now part of it. And a group of patients in this risk group, a high risk group, one part got a laparib, which was the PARP inhibitor, and one group got placebo. And we could do a placebo trial here because these patients had already all had standard therapy and all of these patients had, had early stage but high risk disease. And this was a game changer. So in the trial, in a selective high-risk population of patients who already had standard therapy, be it chemotherapy, biologic therapy, and hormone therapy, the group that got the PARP inhibitor clearly did better. Olaparib reduced the risk for invasive breast cancer recurrence by 42% compared to placebo. And as an adjuvant treatment, reduced the risk of death by 32% in germline high-risk patients. Overall survival improved and event disease-free survival improved. These are good numbers. Now, everything has a price and everything has a cost. And this is, unfortunately, a relatively toxic medication especially in a group of patients that have already had, typically, a pound of chemotherapy. So the toxicity was not to be taken lightly. And as you can see here, without getting into all of these things, there was a fair number of people who had to adjust doses. We had to make dose reductions. And there was a population of patients that stopped. And there were long-term side effects that we saw in these patients so again, you have to be very selective. So the bottom line is this. The bottom line is as an oncologist, we test more and more people 
because now not only do we have screening recommendations, we have therapeutic and treatment recommendations for a population of patients, including those with early disease. So this information is that much more helpful. I wanna thank you again for letting me speak. Um, I wanna thank my sister-in-law who made me the slides. And I wanna thank Tammy who listened to this about 700 times. <laughs> Thank you. That was, <clears throat> excuse me, that was great. Thank you very much. I know you were uh, a little worried about it, but you knocked it out of the park. Um, okay, uh, Lauren Koch. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Koch, president of Pink Aid Long Island. It is my pleasure to introduce senior breast health educator and marketing associate for the Mora Foundation for Breast Health Education, Laura, Lauren Fish Henry. Lauren holds a master's degree in women's history from Sarah Lawrence College and a bachelor's degree in political science with a concentration in women's studies from Marist College. For the past six plus years, she has worked with the Mora Foundation teaching high school, college, corporate and nursing breast health programs that focus on early detection, risk reduction and healthy lifestyle choices. She was instrumental in the creation, curriculum, planning and writing of the Mora Foundation's web-based training course. She also creates and manages all the foundation's social media platforms, ensuring the latest and most vital breast health information reaches their followers. Lauren, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So good morning, everyone. And thank you to Lauren, Amy, and all of the wonderful people at Pink Aid and Pink Aid Long Island for having me present today. Uh, it really is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are so grateful to Pink Aid and their incredible eight years of partnership. Um, in the breast cancer awareness space, we at the Mora Foundation are kind of unique as we typically don't work with breast cancer patients or even survivors. Uh, in fact, the thousands of people we reach every year are mainly teenagers. When Dr. Virginia Moore founded the Moore Foundation 27 years ago, it was her steadfast belief that understanding breast cancer and its risk factors, as well as how to practice early detection at a young age could have life altering effects. Uh, in my six plus years with Moore, I can attest to the resounding impact we have, we're able to have in the lives of the communities we serve. The information we present is real and accessible for students. Uh, I can't tell you how many students have come up to me after my programs and expressed that a parent or a loved one went through breast cancer and they never really understood it until now or told me about their own health concern that they're now going to be proactive about. Moreover, Many of those same young people express how they plan to tell their families about, about what they learned during our programs. Uh, and through our bilingual programs, we're able to get breast health information to underserved vulnerable communities, many of whom have little access to vital breast cancer information. Uh, a couple of years ago, my colleagues and I presented in Massapequa schools. And after our programs, the teacher reached out and shared the story. One of the young women who sat through our program went home that evening and shared what she learned in health class with her family. Her aunt happened to be uh, there for dinner that evening and her aunt shared that she had never gone for a mammogram or even performed a self-exam. Her clearly very smart niece laid out all the reasons caring about her breast health and gave her a step-by-step -step guide for performing a BSE. That night, she went home and performed a self-exam, discovering what she would soon find out was a stage two malignant tumor. I think the, the theme for today is that knowledge in this case, like so many others, wields tremendous power. As we all know, there is no way to completely eliminate the risk of breast cancer. But as my students at, and I will teach you, um, there are very real and attainable ways for us to gain risk reduction. So that will be my focus for today. I will be discussing how controllable, modifiable risk factors influence estrogen levels in the body. 
and the newest research on how they can affect one's chances for developing breast cancer. To do this, we'll focus on four main areas. Nutrition, exercise, smoking, and alcohol. To discuss these, we first need to acknowledge that there are stages in an individual's life where these outside influences are the most impactful. These are prenatal development, meaning development in utero, puberty, pregnancy, and the men, uh, menopausal transition. During these windows, during these stages, the mammary gland undergoes structural and functional changes. As a result, chemical and environmental exposures during these windows can influence breast tissue as well as risk, either positively or negatively. The first one we'll delve into is nutrition. Quite succinctly, following a healthy diet from a young age is key to maintaining our breast health. Although fat and calories are important for development, they must be consumed in moderation and to maintain that healthy body fat percentage. A balanced diet, which includes uh, a high intake of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, poultry, fish, and low fat dairy products has been shown to decrease the risk of cancer. Obesity, unhealthy dietary patterns, and physical inactivity, which we know disproportionately affects minority populations, have been shown to be a major impact on outcomes across the breast cancer continuum. The reality is though, that according to the CDC, only about 10% of adults eat enough fruits and veggies. We all know that improving our diets help to to reduce breast cancer risk, but how many fruits and vegetables should we be eating every day and are all fruits and veggies equally good for us? A good rule of thumb that we always tell our students is that they should be making sure that those fruits and veggies make up about half of their plate with about three to four servings a day. They should be a good mix of different varieties doing our best to avoid high sugar and starchy ones like corn or potatoes. Many of you have probably heard of, or, or may even prescribe to, a whole foods plant-based diet, which has been gaining greater attention over the past couple of years. Many of the staples of this diet are rich in fiber, vitamin C, beta carotene, and selenium, all linked to cancer uh, reduction. Soy, a constant in this type of diet, especially when consumed from whole organic food sources, also is a great, a great breast cancer risk reducer. To further confirm the benefits of this diet, a recent study found that vegetarians actually have a 14% lower risk for developing breast cancer than carnivores. Vegetarian women were 18% less likely than those who ate meat regularly to develop postmenopausal breast cancer. Another excuse me, um, excuse me, one quick second, Lauren. I don't know, are you trying, are you scrolling through a presentation because, um, I know you had one, but it's not moving. So we didn't know if you were. Oh, I am, yes. Oh yeah, no, it hadn't gone. We'd only been on the cover page. We just wanted to make sure we weren't missing anything. It it's just catching up, yeah. Because okay. I know that our connection was slow. I got that notice before. Oh, okay, no problem, just checking. I'm so sorry, go ahead. Well, hopefully it will catch up because it is there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the other area that we've seen a great deal of uh, benefit is in fiber consumption. Uh, a 2020 meta-analysis of data demonstrated that high total fiber consumption was associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer. High intake of fiber during adolescent years has shown to reduce the overall risk of breast cancer by 16% and the risk for breast cancer before menopause by 24%. Uh, when deciding what type of diet to follow is really best to avoid ones that uh, consist of high refined sugar intake, red meat and processed meats, highly processed grains and high fat dairy products as they are all associated with increased risk of cancer. Cancer cells can have many insulin receptors, therefore excess sugar in the body can contribute to cancer cell growth. Uh, a recent study found that eating artificial sweeteners caused a 22% higher risk for developing breast cancer. Even low consumption of these artificial sweeteners was tied to a significantly higher risk for all types of cancers. It also begs mention that we are seeing emerging research about the effects of vitamin D. Uh, new research suggests that women with low levels of vitamin D have higher risk for breast cancer. 
Vitamin D may even play a role in controlling normal breast cell growth and may be able to stop breast cancer cells from growing. This new research is especially important in the light of the disproportionate mortality rates faced by Black women and people of color who historically have low levels of vitamin D. This new research has the potential to be another effective tool in reducing these statistics. In addition to nutrition, we always need to uh, focus on obesity. Poor diet can, in some cases, uh, lead to obesity. Obesity is it's a complex, chronic, and overly um, simplistic advice, um, like eat more and, uh, I'm sorry, eat less and move more is both reductive and unhelpful for people who struggle with weight. The high prevalence of obesity is a major public health concern, um, and, it is and it disproportionately affects uh, non-Hispanic Black women, um, who about 57% of that population are obese, uh, as well as Hispanic women, where we see a 44% of that population struggle with obesity. An estimated 55% of all cancers in women occur in those who are overweight or obese. A 2021 study found breast cancer survivors who are overweight have a statistically significant increased risk for developing uh, second primary cancers. We have also seen increased risk when it comes to triple negative breast cancer patients. A 2021 study found that triple negative patients have a poorer prognosis and overall uh, survival in comparison with lower weight um, triple negative patients. They also saw a 29% increased mortality rate. A study just published found that bariatric surgery uh, has actually started to reduce the incidence of breast cancer by approximately 44%. Um, it should be noted though that while the benefits have been seen uh, through this weight loss surgery, uh, it is not something that is for everyone, nor a cure all or fix all, um, just one option to reduce risk through weight loss. So in addition to talking about nutrition, there is, we also have to talk about exercise. I always say to my students, these things, they go hand in hand. We know that for exercise, for uh, maintaining an active lifestyle, it allows um, a leaner body, enhances your mood, improves sleep and boosts your immune system. Let me, is the PowerPoint catching up? Okay. It is not catching up. Um, I don't know if you want to, I don't know where you are in your, in the presentation in terms of the number, the page number, but I can try if you want to share it from my end and, and, and just go that way. I think you um, should share it, Deb. Sure. Yeah. I'll stop okay. sharing and you can share. All right. Let me go ahead and open it one second. I think, do I have it open? One second. Okay. All right. Give me one second, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know why. No like problem. You know what? It's just the lovely internet. It is. <laughs> okay, hold on one second. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, I don't know why it is all the way. Let's see if I can uh, make it wider. Hold on. Okay, so let me, what page were you on? Oh, perfect. Uh, so uh, a 2016 study showed that young women who exercised at least four hours exercise. were Great. able to reduce their risk of breast cancer by up to 60%. Uh, an epidemiological study from 2003 observed that active women with BRCA mutations had a lower risk of developing breast cancer at a young age compared to women with the same mutations who were inactive. Will you maintain the same level of benefit your whole life? No. Uh, for those who are postmenopausal, risk reduction equates to about six hours a week for about a 30% reduction in risk. The importance of exercise also remains true for breast cancer survivors. A 2021 study found that the risk of recurrence was 63% lower in breast cancer survivors who exercise about two to five days a week compared with inactive participants. Uh, if you can move on to the, the next slide. The next area we'll focus on in terms of lifestyle is smoking and 
uh, the newer iteration of that uh, is vaping. Smoking as a whole has been on the decline in the US for some time, but vaping on the other hand has been increasing in use. Since their introduction in 2003, e-cigarettes have become increasingly more popular as they have been advertised as a healthier, uh, better for you option when compared to cigarette smoke. However, e-cigarette manufacturers have been incorporating addictive nicotine, toxic flavorings, and unknown chemicals into their products. Much like uh, traditional cigarettes, they can contain more than 60 different carcinogens. Studies have shown that uh, they, they can also potentially cause those mammary tumors. The time a person starts smoking is also really important to be aware of. People who smoke during their adolescence are at a 70% increased risk of breast cancer compared to non-smokers. If an individual already has cancerous cells in their body, smoking may speed up the growth of their existing tumor. A woman who is exposed to secondhand smoke is also 24% more likely to develop breast cancer compared to those who are not exposed. Uh, a study from just last year suggested that nicotine also promotes breast cancer metastasis to the lungs. Uh, the next area we'll focus on and uh, it goes hand in hand with smoking is alcohol. So we know that the pandemic has really had profound effects upon our global population. Recent studies have found that Americans have sharply increased consumption of alcohol, drinking on more days per month and to greater excess. Heavy drinking amongst women has soared. A 2020 study found a staggering 41% rise in heavy drinking amongst women. Women are rapidly closing the gender gap in alcohol consumption. In recent years, we have seen women quickly catching up to men in alcohol, uh, in alcohol intake, binge drinking, and alcohol use disorder. This, we know, is not an uncommon response to trauma. But what we also know is that 75% of Americans are unaware, approximately one in four cisgender women are unaware of the link between alcohol and breast cancer. The CDC estimates that about 7,500 breast cancer cases per year are due to BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations, whereas 14,000 cases are due to alcohol. This is true even though the relative risk of getting breast cancer is higher when you have a breast cancer, when you have a BRCA gene mutation than if you drink alcohol. Alcohol is considered a group one carcinogen, meaning it ranks with tobacco, arsenic, and plutonium as carrying the highest cancer risk. Yet alcohol remains the dangerous breast cancer risk factor that people just don't wanna talk about. Drinking is intrinsic to the way Americans socialize, causing many to ignore the risks associated with even one drink. The information is sobering. And yes, that pun was absolutely intended. Uh, alcohol consumption is both associated with primary breast cancer and may even be a tumor promoter. A 2020 study published in, clin in the Clinical Journal of Oncology Nursing found higher risk for breast cancer recurrence in survivors with moderate to heavy drinking habits. Alcohol affects the way estrogen is metabolized, causing estrogen levels in the body to increase. Research has shown that having one drink per day increases the risk for breast cancer by about seven to 10% in women. Men who consume one drink per day increase their risk for breast cancer by about 16%. So by now, you are probably suffering from something I call risk factor fatigue. You've had a lot of information thrown at you and are wondering, where do I go from here? You may also be saying to yourself, well, I've had a lot of years of living a certain way that I can't erase. What's my next step to reduce my risk for breast cancer going forward? My answer is always, we can't change the past. We can only change how we move forward. Maybe it's trying out a meat free Monday. Maybe it is committing to taking yourself for a walk three times a week. Maybe it's limiting yourself to one alcoholic drink a week, or even just committing to researching tobacco cessation programs. Whatever that first step is for you, I encourage you, I implore you to take it. Thank you all so much.
Thank you so much, Lon. That was great. Okay, well, uh, I'm Michelle Corman, Pink Aid co-president, and a huge thank you to all our speakers. Uh, your presentations were informative and interesting and educational and very helpful. Uh, I'm gonna start off with some genetic testing questions. Um, so if you've already had the BRCA test with a negative or a positive result, should you, are there any new um, genetic tests you should be taking now? Um, Rich or Susan? You should do the panel test. If, you, um, if you've been tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2. Okay. Um, okay, so regardless of whether you had a negative or a positive result in, with the BRCA test. Um, we do see people with more than one mutation. So I think the, the bottom line is your yes. genetics do need to be up to date. And, and that is, a, that is a, a moving target because we keep getting new, new genes. So it's something you should you know, periodically update with your doc and your genetic counselor. Thank you. Um, what is the right age for the children of breast cancer survivors to start getting genetic testing and mammos and ultrasound? So, so the answer is, is you don't do genetic testing on children unless you've done genetic testing on their parents. Um, because you wouldn't look for a gene in, in, a, in a child or an offspring if both parents uh, were tested and were negative or were low risk. So, so that would be the answer. Now, in a patient, in a, in a, young, in a person whose parents have uh, a mutation, then there are very defined uh, recommendations as to when genetic testing should begin. And usually we say about 25 for the mm -hmm. bracket mutation, correct? Yes, so, 25. Okay, thank you. And has there been any luck in suppressing the gene that causes breast cancer? So, oh, I guess I'm answering. So <laughs> I just kind of do what I'm told. Um, um, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, as you see, as we see in oncology, things evolve. We did, we did PARP inhibitors in advanced disease. Now we're doing PARP inhibitors in early stage disease. It would make sense that we would start to think about doing certain medication alterations in patients who are high risk. One would expect that to be coming shortly. Okay, let's hope. And finally, are PARP inhibitors covered by insurance? When they're given in the appropriate setting, they are. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, Lauren, did you? Um... Uh, yeah. Um, so Lauren, um, at the beginning of your lecture, lecture, you discussed stages of development. If you were someone who has already transitioned through two or three of these stages, is lifestyle modification even worth it? Um, in short, yes, absolutely. Um, even if there is somebody who is postmenopausal, there is still a great deal of benefit that can be gained from lifestyle modification, um, whether that is through um, starting to exercise, weight loss, um, improving one's diet, absolutely there is benefit at, really at any stage in a person's life. Um, we know that there are these windows of susceptibility where the outside factors um, certainly can have a greater influence on that breast cancer risk, um, but you can absolutely reduce risk at any stage of your life at any age. Great. Um, now you mentioned um, the effects of alcohol. Does this mean that you should never drink alcohol? <laughs> you know, I, I can say Whenever I teach a corporate program or whenever I am teaching to a community program, that is always one of the first things that they ask me. And they're like, does that mean I can never have a drink again? Um, and we are big fans here at the Moore Foundation of doing things in moderation, whether that is through diet, whether, you know, because certainly, you know, you're going to go out and have fast food at some point. You just don't want to be eating it every day. And it's the same thing with alcohol. We want to make sure that people are just aware of the risk factor that goes into having uh, any drink, whether it's beer, wine, or liquor. Um, and, you know, I get a lot of people who say to me, you know, my doctor has said, uh, I'm sorry, I've heard people say 
like, oh, well, I've heard there's a lot of cardioprotective properties to drinking alcohol. And in fact, a lot of those cardioprotective properties are really negated by the negative health effects of drinking alcohol. Um, and people also just need to be aware of how much they're drinking. Um, are actually only about a half a glass uh, of something like a red wine every day. Um, most people when they're drinking at home are probably drinking when they're pouring their own glass of wine or going out to dinner. It's probably closer to two or three glasses of wine. So that's when we start to see those really negative uh, health effects. So I always just recommend if you're going to drink, um, drink, so, drink in moderation, be aware of how much you're drinking um, and go from there. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned also that soy decreases breast cancer risk, um, but I've heard the opposite. Can you talk about yeah, that? So that is one of, I think, the biggest things out there when talking about breast cancer information is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I was recently reading in uh, US News um, on a source like Pinterest about uh, one third of all the breast cancer information that's on there is actually incorrect, inaccurate, misleading, um, and it comes from a source that is trying to sell you something. Um, so I think it's always important when looking up issues, especially in terms of lifestyle, that you're aware of the source of that information, the perspective that um, that health information is coming from. So for soy, uh, we there have been lots of studies um, in recent years in terms of the benefits, uh, whether positive or negative, and we have seen some really positive benefits to eating those whole grain um, organic, most definitely sources of soy. Um, you always just wanna be aware um, of any like additional additives or substances that take away from that purity of that soy. Um, so again, just really being mindful of the types of foods you're eating, but soy most definitely is not going to increase breast cancer risk. It's actually gonna do the opposite. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, Amy? Uh, yes. Hi. So um, thank you for everyone who has sent in some questions uh, on the chat during the um, lecture. So I'm going to go through some of them. The first one that I have is how often should a patient uh, be genetically tested throughout their lifetime? Well, it's, it's going to be dependent upon what new genes are found. Because as I mentioned, my, you know, there, there's changes all the time. Some of these genes that cause that are associated with uh, cancer weren't thought to be, say, to over ten years ago. So mm -hmm. I can't. There's no real answer for that. You just have to just talk to your doctor about it when you when you go to uh, for your checkups. Got it. Thank you. Um, the other one is uh, again for you is you two is do you advise couples in which one person is positive for BRCA to go through IVF? You want to answer that question? No, you go ahead. So, I, I mean, I think that's a loaded question. Yeah. I know some very, <clears throat> very wonderful people who are BRCA positive. So, I think that's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Got you. Okay. Um, the next question is, I think you answered that one, uh, uh, recent results in a Sloan Kettering rectal cancer drug. Uh, the success of that, is that related to the genetic drugs you've spoken of or the genetic testing maybe? When, when we talk, when we do, we, there's genetics and there's genomics. Genetics is somebody's intrinsic biology, uh, what you got from your mom and what you got from your dad. And genomics refers to the proteins that are specific for specific types of tumors. Genomics mm -hmm. has become a rapidly growing area in oncology, especially in advanced disease. And it's something that's allowed us to really focus therapy, minimize toxicity. And we have seen really, really promising, promising results from that. That's great. That is actually interesting. Um, okay, and then the other question is, is it possible for a young adult who is a direct descendant of someone who has uh, BRCA1 positive mutation for getting cancer at an earlier age? At an earlier age? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'd just like to make one comment about lifestyle. I really appreciate everything that was said. I, I think the bottom line with lifestyle is when you do, when I see a patient with breast cancer, we spend 
we talk about chemotherapy, we talk about radiation, we talk about hormones, and we talk about lifestyle, and, and we focus on weight and walking, <laughs> weight and walking and why. And, and I think the bottom line is, is moderation is absolutely the key without any specific recommendations. Okay, I, I agree. Can I add um, one thing to what I said earlier? When we said earlier, yeah. Rach, there is something in genetics it's referred to as anticipation. And with an autosomal dominantly inherited disease, if you have a parent that has it, you are more likely to get it when you're younger. Okay, great. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, and I, nothing else has popped up. Let me just double check before we go. Um, I think this was great. And I think I know that all of us at Pink Aid want to thank uh, Dr. Zelkowitz, Susan Capasso, and Lauren Fish Henry for your time. It's been extremely uh, helpful hour. Um, thank you again. We really appreciate this from Warrior Connection, from Pink Aid, and from everyone who's following along today. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. And um, this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and anyone that wants to watch this, it's being recorded. So if anyone missed yes. it, one, one, one of you, they, they can. Yes. So wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your support, Thank you. everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, everyone.